Hello, everybody. Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology 2, and specifically uh, Blood Vessel Lecture number 1. As always, there's a set of learning objectives. For those of you who have been paying attention, you notice the learning objectives correlate very closely with the lecture handouts that we go over in class and the learning objectives on the study guide. So paying attention to them is important, and without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started, and we're going to go learning objective 1. Define perfusion. Perfusion, it, perfusion means blood flow. So when you say an organ is perfused, what you're really saying is an organ is receiving blood or blood is flowing through the blood vessels within that organ. The functional role of the heart is technically when it contracts, it generates a pressure gradient in which blood moves from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure along a pressure gradient. And it is that blood pressure this is the reason we have a blood pressure that physically perfuses organs. If organs and tissues are not perfused with blood, they're not getting things like oxygen and nutrients. They're not getting rid of metabolic wastes. And if they're not being perfused with blood, they won't be able to make ATP. They'll start building up waste. The tissues will die and the tissues will become necrotic. So the reason we have a blood pressure in the first place in the functional role of the heart is to generate a blood pressure that allows us to perfuse organs. When you look at your finger and you squeeze it and then you let it go and it goes from being white to being kind of pinkish reddish, what you're looking at is a phenomenon called capillary reperfusion. What you've done when you pinch it is you've clamped off the capillaries in your finger and when you let it go, you've relieved or alleviated the pressure on those capillaries and because you have a blood pressure, the blood flows back into those capillaries and capillary reperfusion in your fingers and your toes is a really important marker of how well your heart's working. So you'll notice people like uh, cardiologists do that all the time. They'll evaluate capillary reperfusion. Now, when you think about the functional role of the heart, the functional role of the heart is it works as a hydraulic pump that physically contracts, and when it contracts, notably the ventricles, it generates a pressure gradient that moves blood from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Now, we rem remember we have our pulmonary and systemic circulations. I'm going to focus on the systemic circulation for the moment, and I'm going to say the highest pressure in the system is in the left ventricle during ventricular systole. Blood then moves from the left ventricle into the aorta, into the aortic arch, into the system of arteries that take blood away from the heart. Recall, recall from previous discussion that arteries are simply blood vessels that take blood away from the heart. The oxygenation status of the blood is irrelevant. Arteries take blood away from the heart, and if you notice, the pressure in the arteries is roughly equal to the pressure in the left ventricle during ventricular systole, and it's that peak pressure that we call systolic pressure, but the more important point here is that in general, arteries are relatively high pressure systems. Arteries then branch over and over again to form smaller blood vessels, and eventually we lead into our microcirculation, and we get into areas like capillaries. Capillaries are the most abundant and most important blood vessels in the body because that's the point at which exchange between the cardiovascular system and the cells of your tissue occurs. And when I talk about exchange, I'm talking about nutrient exchange, oxygen exchange, metabolic waste exchange, right? We deliver oxygen and nutrients to tissues. We take metabolic waste away from tissues. After blood is flowed through the capillaries, which has a much lower pressure because blood is flowing from areas of high pressure to low pressure, so arteries are a much higher pressure system than capillaries, that blood is then drained by veins. Now you'll notice that veins, which are blood vessels that bring blood back to the heart, have a much lower pressure than even capillaries. In fact, veins are one of the lower pressure uh, portions within the entire system. And the functional role of a vein is to bring blood back to the heart. Now, most arteries are depicted as red because they're carrying oxygen-rich blood, and most veins are depicted as blue because they're carrying oxygen-poor blood. But that gets flipped on its head a little bit when we talk about the pulmonary circulation. So just remember that a vein is technically defined as a vessel that brings blood back to the heart. Unlike arteries, 
Veins are incredibly low pressure systems because pressure has dissipated as it's passed through this capillary network. The capillaries, again, are the point of exchange, and the lowest pressure in the system is actually in the right ventricle during ventricular diastole, and that's how blood circulates around the body. We were looking at cardiac output questions the other day. You can circulate your entire volume of blood in a minute at rest. So when we think about factors that determine blood pressure, and this is where we start getting into our handout. So factors that determine blood, ves blood pressure, peripheral resistance. Now blood vessel length isn't gonna change often. Now, if you accumulate things like adipose tissue or muscle tissue, you're going to have more blood vessels to feed them and the heart's going to have to work a little bit harder and sometimes that can increase peripheral resistance. But in general, blood vessel length we're going to think of as remaining relatively the same. Blood vessel diameter, on the other hand, is going to change all the time and this is a primary mechanism by which the nervous system actually regulates blood pressure. When I use the term vasoconstrict, V-A-S-O-C-O-N-S-T-R-I-C-T, when I use the term vasoconstriction, I'm talking about a blood vessel that has narrowed its diameter, and it does that by contracting the smooth muscle within the layers of the blood vessel wall. When vasoconstriction happens, peripheral resistance increases, vasodilation on the other hand, is when the smooth muscle in a blood vessel relaxes, and that increases flow by decreasing peripheral resistance. So you can change blood pressure by changing the diameter of a vessel. Typically, blood flowing through narrow vessels is going to be at higher pressure, and typically blood flowing through uh, vessels with a greater diameter is going to be at a little bit of a lower pressure and we'll talk about how that's important in regulating flow to specific organs. The viscosity of blood can also determine or be a part of peripheral resistance, but blood viscosity doesn't change that much. The most important thing here is blood vessel diameter and the idea of vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Sure, you can get changes in blood vessel viscosity. For example, if you have a splenectomy and your hematocrit rises dramatically, the viscosity of your blood can also increase, increasing peripheral resistance. And then, of course, obstructions in blood vessels, which is really vessel diameter. If you have things like plaques, arteriosclerotic plaques building up along blood vessels, that's going to increase peripheral resistance and it's probably going to raise or elevate blood pressure. So we have peripheral resistance, then we have cardiac output, and remember what the equation for cardiac output is from our previous lectures. Cardiac output is equal to stroke volumes in milliliter per beat, multiplied by heart rate in beats per minute. If you do the dimensional analysis and the cancellation, the unit of cardiac output is milliliter per unit time, and we were calculating it milliliters per minute. So when we think about the things that can affect heart rate, like our sympathetic nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic having a positive chronotropic effect, parasympathetic having a negative chronotropic effect, cardiac output goes up, blood pressure typically goes up, cardiac output goes down, blood pressure typically goes down. The next thing we're going to look at is blood volume, and blood volume is a really, really important one. It's one that we don't often think about. But blood volume is talking about the actual volume of blood that we have floating around in our cardiovascular system or being pushed around in our cardiovascular system or pumped or whatever you want to say. The bottom line here is that there is a relationship between blood volume and blood pressure and it's nearly a linear relationship. So if blood volume increases, blood pressure will increase. If blood volume decreases, blood pressure will decrease. And one of the main organ systems that regulates blood volumes is the urinary system, notably uh, the functionality of the kidneys. So the kidneys play a really important role in regulating blood pressure by regulating blood volume. So as we think about these three factors and what they can do to blood pressure, let's think about some of the questions that have been asked. So on your handout, you're just asked to kind of walk through all of these. And then in one question, it says, Jessica drinks three glasses of water. Based on this, what do you think the short-term impact on blood pressure would be and why? Well, if Jessica drinks water, 
that water is going to be absorbed along the lining of her GI tract into her blood. And if water is being absorbed into the blood, what's actually going to happen to the blood volume? And if the blood volume goes one way, blood pressure is also going to go that same way. So think about that. Think about what would happen if we had parasympathetic or sympathetic stimulation. Are we going to get positive or negative chronotropic effects, meaning is heart rate going to increase or decrease? And if heart rate increases or decreases and uh, cardiac output decreases, that's probably going to decrease blood pressure. Finally, we get things like peripheral resistance. Remember from the autonomic nervous system that the only division of the autonomic nervous system that has motor outputs to the blood vessels is the sympathetic division. So if the sympathetic division activates in certain areas, it's going to cause vasoconstriction, which is actually going to increase peripheral resistance and increase blood pressure. If the sympathetic nervous system is inhibited, or slows down in certain areas, it's going to decrease peripheral resistance and therefore decrease blood pressure. So think about those questions. What's actually going to influence blood pressure? And again, why do we care about blood pressure? We need blood pressure to perfuse organs. We need pressure, blood going from areas of high pressure to low pressure in order to deliver blood to the intricate blood vessel networks that feed your organs and tissues without a blood pressure your blood stagnates, your organs and tissues such as your brain no longer get things like oxygen and nutrients. They start building up metabolic waste. If your brain isn't getting blood, it starts to die or neurons in your brain start to die after about four minutes of not having oxygen. Irreversible brain damage. So yes, moving blood around the body is important and we already know that because we've already talked about the heart and the cardiovascular system uh, with a focal point on the heart and a lot of the things that we're just kind of reviewing right here. So when we think about this, a couple of things I want you to understand is one, what's the only division of the nervous system that has a direct motor output to the smooth muscle lining blood vessels and that is the sympathetic nervous system. When the sympathetic nervous system activates essentially alpha adrenergic receptors in the lining of the smooth muscle lining the blood vessels, it's going to stimulate vasoconstriction and that's going to bring blood pressure up. And that's why, for example, chronic stress can actually lead to hypertension because your sympathetics are being activated all the time. All your blood vessels are vasoconstricted, right? And that's going to jack your blood pressure up. It's also going to make your heart rate go a little bit faster. And if your heart rate's going faster, if you think about cardiac output, heart rate multiplied by stroke volume, cardiac output's going to go up. So you got constricted blood vessels, you got increased heart rates, and... Uh, increased cardiac output, yeah, that's going to produce a dramatic effect with respect to uh, blood pressure. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, our rest or digest system, so we have our fight or, fight or flight and our rest and digest system. Parasympathetic nervous system is going to slow things down. It's going to decrease heart rate. It's going to decrease contractility, meaning it's going to have negative chronotropic and negative inotropic effects. That's going to decrease cardiac output and therefore decrease blood pressure. It's one of the reasons that just taking a, a few nice deep breaths and calming yourself can be so good uh, for you and why meditation can have such profoundly positive impacts on, on disease states like hypertension. Get your heart under control. Get your mind under control. The parasympathetic nervous system doesn't directly impact blood vessels, but it can impact the activity of the sympathetics. And if the parasympathetics inhibit the activity of the sympathetics, when the sympathetics aren't firing, blood vessels will vasodilate. The combination of slowing down heart rate and vasodilating the blood, blood vessels will bring blood pressure down. And a lot of times that's very important. There's a balance here. We need pressure to be high enough to get blood to all of our organs and oxygen and nutrients to our tissues, but we don't want it to be so high that it's ripping our blood vessels apart, putting it as at increased risk for things like stroke or aneurysm. So there are five types of blood vessels you need to know, and if you look at your follow along on your handout, major blood vessels you need to know. So there's the aorta. The aorta is essentially the first major 
uh, kind of trunk for all of the arteries. So we have the aorta. The five blood vessels that you need to know are arteries. And some things you need to know about arteries. So we have this thing here called mean systemic blood pressure in millimeters of mercury. Millimeter of mercury is a measurement of pressure. It's how much pressure the blood is exerting against the side of the blood vessel wall, really. But it's just a measurement of pressure. And notice that blood is flowing from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Mean is kind of an average. So arteries are blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. Blood flowing through arteries tends to be high-pressure blood, and it's pulsatile, and we'll talk about what that means in just a little bit. Arteries then branch over and over again to form part of your microcirculation. Your microcirculation is essentially these small blood vessels that play a very important role in controlling the distribution of blood in your body called arterioles. Arterioles eventually feed into capillaries, which branch into these really vast networks in all of the tissues of your body. Capillaries are by far the most abundant and most important type of blood vessel because that's where exchange occurs. So substances move across the capillary wall, right? They move across the capillary wall where they become interstitial fluid and ultimately exchange with the cells. This is where we get the exchange of oxygen, nutrients, gases, metabolic wastes, uh, chemical signaling molecules like hormones. It's happening at the level of capillaries. Capillaries are then drained by very small veins, essentially, but they're still part of your microcirculation called venules. So arterioles, capillaries, and venules are all kind of lumped into this thing called the microcirculation. They're much more easily observed under a microscope. Venules then fuse and they drain blood and ultimately they fuse to form these larger vessels with very low pressure called veins. The vena cava, of course, the superior vena cava is the common drainage point of blood from, let's say, the superior one-third of the body, the inferior from the inferior two-thirds of the body, and the coronary sinus, of course, from the heart itself. And then that blood is going to be returned, that oxygen-poor, nutrient-depleted blood is going to be returned back to the right side of the heart in preparation for pulmonary circulation. So those are the blood vessels you need to know. And one of the phenomenon that I really want you to understand is fluids, gases, right? It, gradients in general are important. We've talked about concentration gradients. We've talked about osmotic gradients. Now we're just talking about something called a pressure gradient. And Flow, which is the amount of blood moving through a certain, let's say, vessel at a given point in time, is ultimately largely dependent on pressure and resistance. Delta P here means change in pressure, and you need a delta P in order for fluid to move through the cardiovascular system. So if you look at this blood vessel right here, you look at this end and it's about 100 millimeters of mercury, this end and it's about 75 millimeters of mercury. The delta P here is you take one end, you subtract it from the other, and you get a total pressure of about 25 millimeters of mercury, right? That's the pressure promoting flow from point A to point B. Even though this network of blood vessels down here is a much lower pressure system, about 40 mmHg and 15 mmHg, the delta P is the same and therefore flow is going to be equal. So on an exam, think about me playing around with those particular numbers. Think about me taking an image like this and maybe putting the 100 over here and the 75 over here. Or what if I had 100 here and 100 here, or 25 here and 25 here? Well, what would happen if there was no delta P? If delta P was zero, it would mean there was no pressure gradient and therefore blood couldn't move. If delta P was zero, you would be dead, right? It would mean your heart was no longer beating and therefore no pressure gradient would exist. You wouldn't have a blood pressure. You wouldn't be perfusing organs with blood to get them the things that they need from the blood, like nutrients and oxygen, also rinsing out metabolic wastes. So think about questions like that with respect to flow. Now... One of the things that I want you to understand about the physics of fluid flow, and your handout has a couple of questions that are similar to this on it, but we're going to go over questions that you're going to get. So 
Resistance is actually this big, long, crazy equation in which it takes viscosity and length of the blood vessel, pi multiplied by radius, raised to the power of four. So that's what resistance is. If you're just to calculate resistance here, and if I said something different, sorry, I don't have a lot of time to edit this video because I didn't know the campus was going to be closed. So resistance is equal to this big, long equation here, but the factor in resistance that I really want you paying attention to is this radius raised to the power of four. The one thing we can really control, our nervous system has immediate control over, is the radius of a blood vessel. We can decrease radius by causing the smooth muscle lining a blood vessel to start to contract, and we can produce vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction increases resistance and therefore decreases blood flow. So vaso vasoconstriction right, increases resistance and therefore decreases blood flow because if there's more resistance to blood moving to a certain area, blood flow is going to decrease. Vasodilation, on the other hand, right, decreases resistance and therefore increases blood flow. So the way that we regulate the distribution of blood in our body, because blood isn't flowing to all of our organs and tissues at the exact same rate all the time, we direct blood or shunt blood to where we need it, is largely controlled by this idea of resistance. And resistance is really controlled by vasoconstriction or vasodilation. So before we even get into talking about the math of this, because this looks like some big complicated math problem, and it's really not when you understand what's going on here. And I'm going to give you a practice problem within your uh, particular um, handout that will reinforce this idea. But we'll do the figure question for the moment, and we'll figure out the figure question. Let's say that somebody's just eaten a hamburger, and they're laying on the couch. And we're thinking about where we're going to get the direction of blood flow or where blood flow is going to be directed by our cardiovascular system. At this time, the parasympathetic nervous system is going to be activated and our rest and digest systems are going to be activated. And a long story short, if I said which of the following would be true of this individual who's just eaten a hamburger and is sitting on the couch, think about where you're going to get vasoconstriction of blood vessels and vasodilation of blood vessels and how that's going to affect the distribution of blood in the body. So if you've just eaten a hamburger, the blood vessels that feed into the GI tract are going to vasodilate in order to increase blood flow to the GI tract because that's ultimately where we're absorbing food at. That's the active tissue in the body. On the flip token, the blood vessels that feed into things like skeletal muscle, for example, are going to vasoconstrict a bit because if we're just gotten done eating a hamburger and we're sitting on the couch, there's no reason to shunt a huge amount of blood to our skeletal muscles if they're not being active. And one of the ways that cramps can be caused or problems with skeletal muscles, one of the reasons you don't swim after eating a large meal is all your blood is being directed toward your GI tract. If you start exercising right after you eat a big meal, your body becomes confused about where it should direct blood and you don't get adequate blood flow anywhere and it can produce uh, problems like cramping. So when we think about this particular image, I just want to emphasize the power of vasoconstriction and vasodilation with respect to the amount of blood or the magnitude of the change that you see in blood flow from one area to another. So if we look here, resistance is roughly equal, approximately equal. That's what that little kind of uh, half infinity symbol there means. And I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head because I don't care. The approximate symbol. 1 over radius raised to the power of 4. In other words, this isn't a linear relationship. We are talking about an exponential relationship in which the radius of a blood vessel has huge impacts, right? Exponential impacts on the distribution and flow of blood in the body. Flow is roughly equal to 1 over resistance. So if we look at this particular system and we say... If this radius is one, we'll say millimeter, and the volume coming out of this particular uh, pipe 
is one liter per unit time, let's say one liter per minute. If we were to double its radius, well, let's pretend this is a blood vessel. This is an artificial blood vessel system. What would doubling radius be called? Would it be called vasoconstriction? No, vasoconstriction would decrease radius. It'd be called vasodilation. And when you look at this power of four relationship, you can essentially take two, raise it to the power of four, which is 16, two times two times two times two, right? And it's 16. In other words, if you double radius, you don't increase, you don't double the flow of fluid, and in this case, blood to a particular region of the body. You increase that flow by a factor of 16. So instead of there being one liter per, let's say, minute, there would be 16 liters per minute going to a specific area. And you could say whatever you want. I'm just putting arbitrary units to that. So really think about this uh, question. If radius A changes to 3, the flow through A will be about blank times the flow through B. Well, change that to 3, raise it to the power of 4, compare the two numbers, and see what happens, right? Divide one by the other. In other words, you'll take this, you'll take 3, raise it to the power of 4, divide it by 16. You roughly know how many times more flow there is going to be through, uh, in this case, vessel A than vessel B. So it seems complicated, but we're just talking about uh, that, that resistance and that the, the diameter of a blood vessel. What I'm really trying to get at is small changes in blood vessel diameter, whether you vasoconstrict or vasodilate, has massive effects on blood flow. So the primary mechanism by which the nervous system regulates the distribution of blood in the body is by triggering either vasoconstriction or vasodilation. It's not only the nervous system that does that, but it's incredibly important. So let's take a look at a question like this. Let's say I give you a system like uh, this on the exam. And I say, okay, this is blood vessel A. So flow is equal to the change in pressure over resistance. And we know resistance is roughly equal to one over uh, radius raised to the power of four. So we look at this and we go, okay, well, first, in this system, when there is a delta P of 25 millimeters of mercury and the radius of the blood vessel is one millimeter, we get one liter per hour of blood flow. And this is totally arbitrary. I'm not picking anything. I'm just trying to highlight the importance of vasoconstriction and vasodilation, right? So we get one liter of blood flow per hour. Then, let's say this tissue becomes active. So the tissue that this blood vessel is feeding becomes active. If the tissue that this blood vessel is feeding becomes metabolically active, what are we going to want to shunt into that area? What are we going to want to get to that particular tissue? We're going to want to get more blood. And if we want to get more blood to that tissue, we're going to have to increase blood flow. So notice that this blood vessel, it's the same blood vessel, but now it's post vasodilation. So we vasodilated this blood vessel and notice the overall pressure has changed, but the delta P hasn't. The pressure gradient remains roughly the same. Now we've changed this from one millimeter to three millimeters. And I'm saying, what do you think the new blood flow here is gonna be? Well, I can figure out the fold by just taking three and raising it to the power of four. So if I take 3 and raise it to the power of 4, so 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 3 is 27, 27 times 3 is 81, you're talking about 81 liters of blood for, per hour flowing through that particular blood vessel. In other words, when you triple radius, you increase flow by a factor of 87, or 81, pardon me. That is huge. Small changes in the Radius or diameter of a blood vessel through either vasoconstriction, which reduces flow, or vasodilation, which increases flow, can have massive impacts on where blood is flowing in the body. So that's the takeaway from that. And think about questions in which you get things like that. I'm just kind of looking at your handout. I have a bit of an updated handout for y'all. Now, the five blood vessels you need to know.
now that we know kind of what dictates flow and, and we have a set of terms that we can all use, arteries take blood away from the heart. Arteries tend to be thick, high-pressure vessels, um, and they ultimately branch and branch and branch again, and arteries will ultimately branch and feed into the much smaller blood vessels called arterioles. Arterioles are part of our microcirculation. We have billions of them in our body, and they feed into capillary networks or capillary beds directly. Notice that when I use arteries and arterioles, I use the term feeds, as opposed to when I use venules and veins, I use the term drains. Arterioles feed into capillaries, and capillaries are essentially the point of exchange, the most abundant and most important blood vessel because that's where exchange is taking place, right? So nutrient exchange, oxygen exchange, metabolic waste exchange, the exchange of chemical messaging molecules, all taking place at the level of the capillaries. Without capillaries, the cardiovascular system is useless. There would be no exchange. It would be like having a UPS truck that couldn't deliver anything anywhere. Venules then drain those capillaries. They fuse and fuse and fuse because this is a closed system, right? Unlike insects, which just kind of circulate this stuff called paralymph around in their body. We, our circulatory system is closed, meaning that the blood that goes out has to come back, right? Minus a little bit of fluid that's lost to the interstitial space. We have venules and the venules drain the capillary beds. Venules fuse to form larger vessels called veins and veins are low pressure vessels that ultimately bring blood back to the heart. So with each of these, you're going to have to know a little something about arteries. You're going to have to know a little something about arterioles, about capillaries, about venules, and about veins, especially with respect to their structure and their overall function. Now, rather than using this particular diagram, we're going to start going over these one by one. But what I want you to do is as we start to list major characteristics, I want you to come back here and I want you to talk about major differences because I will definitely do something on an exam like ask you to compare and contrast the functional role of arteries versus veins, right? or the structure and function of an artery versus a vein, for example. I'll definitely ask you to define perfusion. I'll definitely ask you what drives blood through the system. I'll definitely ask you the factors that can influence blood pressure. There are a lot of things that I can potentially ask. So, as we move on, if you look at the updated handout, not the handout that I gave you in class, but after this first page, the second page on your updated handout is a labeling activity that we're going to be doing that has these particular vessels. And these are the histology. These are very similar to the histology models. This is a histology diagram of an artery versus a vein. So when you look at an artery versus a vein, arteries and veins both have three major layers. They both have the tunica and turna. And the tunica and turna, so if I say, identify the major layer indicated by the pointer. There's the tunica and turna, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. If I ask you to identify the specific sublayers within the tunica and turna, the tunica media, or the tunica externa, then I'm asking you to identify the things that we're going to talk about individually and what their functional uh, kind of relevance is. So tunica and turna, we're going to start with the artery. Endothelium. Endothelium is a special name for the simple squamous epithelium that lines blood vessels and that lines the chambers of the heart, frankly, except it's not called endothelium there. So endothelium is a special name for the simple squamous epithelial tissue that lines blood vessels. Why would you want simple squamous epithelial tissue lining blood vessels? Because it is nice and smooth. We don't want anything like stray collagen fibers hanging out and potentially latching onto a platelet and uh, causing a blood clot. Or we want blood flowing nice and smoothly through these vessels. And that endothelium is a structural adaptation that allows that to happen with those nice, flat, kind of smooth cells.
<clears throat> so within the tunica interna, the deepest sublayer is the endothelium, simple squamous epithelial tissue that's nice and smooth. Like all epithelial tissues, it's locked down to an underlying connective tissue matrix by a basement membrane. So this basement membrane is essentially a layer of proteoglycan glue that latches uh, the cells of the epithelial tissue down to the deeper structures within the, the um, blood vessel wall. Now, one of the major differences here, I'm not saying that veins don't have any elastic tissue. Veins have a lot of elastic properties, but I am going to highlight the internal elastic lamina and the external elastic lamina on the artery. The internal and external elastic lamina, the internal elastic lamina being part of the tunica interna and the external elastic lamina being part of the tunica media, are elastic tissues with a bunch of elastic fiber, so it's elastic connective tissue essentially. And if you remember, elastic fibers allow for things to distend or for things to kind of stretch and then return to their original shape or retract, right? So what gives arteries their capabilities? When you look at an artery, an artery is a really high pressure system. When the ventricles are in systole, you get a pulsatile wave of blood, meaning you get a high pressure rush of blood flowing through and the arteries have to be able to expand. And then when the ventricles are in diastole, the arteries have to be able to retract or return back to their original shape. And what allows for that elastic characteristic, right, of the arteries to ultimately expand and then recoil, that's the word I was looking at rather than retract, recoil, so they expand and then they recoil, is this elastic tissue. If you pull on an artery, like when we do the cat dissection, I want you to pull an artery out and I physically want you to pull on it, right? I physically just want you to kind of tug on it. Arteries are really, really elastic. And this elastic lamina is really important because arteries are under such high pressure that they need to be able to adapt to the pressure fluctuations of ventricular systole and ventricular diastole. So they expand and then they recoil, they expand and they recoil, and they have to be really dynamic tissues to be able to do that effectively all day, every day. So that's the tunica interna and that's the functional role of the elastic lamina. Remember, arteries are high pressure systems. They pulse with the beating of the heart. That's why you can feel a radial pulse, which is where you always feel a pulse in an awake conscious adult like we did in lab the other day. You're feeling the expansion and the recoil of the artery itself, which corresponds to ventricular systole and ventricular diastole and tells you about heart rate, right? The only reason that it's capable of doing that is because it's perfused with all of this elastic connective tissue. And that's what the elastic lamina are. So the tunica media, if you notice, the tunica media of an artery is much thicker than the tunica media of a vein. And that's because arteries play a little bit more of an important role in the distribution of blood in the body coming from the heart, meaning that arteries, they're not the primary determinants of this, but they can vasoconstrict and vasodilate to a greater degree, ultimately controlling where blood is going to flow, right? And then arterioles play a very, very important role in that. So we have the tunica media, which is made out of smooth muscle. It's not that veins don't have a tunica media, it's just much thinner. And one of the ways you can actually increase the vascular tone of veins is to take a cold shower, which is really good for your cardiovascular system because it facilitates venous return of blood to the heart. It's why the military makes the men do so many cold water exercises. Finally, we have the tunica externa and the vasovasorum. The vasovasorum are actually the blood vessels that feed blood vessels, weirdly enough. So when you look at those on the models, you're just looking at blood vessels that feed the tissue of blood vessels because all of your tissues need blood. And again, it's just a dense connective tissue structure, right, perfused with blood vessels that stabilizes the blood vessel externally. Now, that's our artery. If I was to ask you to compare and contrast an artery versus a vein, and notice how much time I'm spending on this on a day I technically have off to make sure that you guys get caught up and gals and all people in the world, everybody is welcome in my class, right? Get caught up. <clears throat> 
spending a lot of time on this because the structure of an artery is important in comparative to the structure of a, of a vein in understanding the cardiovascular system. So if I asked you, what's the primary functional role of an artery? It takes blood away from the heart, right? And ultimately it feeds blood into the tissues and a network of microcirculation. What's the pressure? Well, arteries are relatively high pressure systems, right? Because they're, they are delivering blood away from the heart and the, the blood flowing into them is coming directly from the ventricles after ventricular systole. So because they're high pressure systems, they have to be perfused with a lot of elastic connective tissue in order to be able to compensate for those pressure fluctuations during systole and diastole. So they're very high pressure systems. They take blood away from the heart and ultimately feed it into arterioles which feed capillaries and that's the point of exchange. If I was to ask you, what are some anatomical differences between an artery and a vein? Well, I'd want you to be able to tell me that arteries have the internal and external elastic lamina, and they have much more elastic connective tissue than veins do. And why do they have much more elastic connective tissue than veins do? That's to compensate for pressure fluctuations. The other thing I'd want you to be able to tell me is to distinguish between an artery and a vein is arteries have a much thicker tunica media and the tunica media is compri composed predominantly of smooth muscle or entirely of smooth muscle, predominantly of smooth muscle, right? I haven't edited. Just, just deal with it. I misspoke after 30 minutes straight. So composed predominantly of smooth muscle and notice that the tunica media of an artery is much thicker than the tunica media of a vein, so it has a much greater capability of undergoing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. It's also a structural feature that uh, in some ways prevents arteries from being susceptible to things like aneurysms or bursting. So when we look at a vein on the other hand, we get the tunica interna, the tunica media, which is much uh, uh, thinner, and we have many more veins actually, and veins tend to have a larger diameter than arteries do. Wherever we take, think of veins and arteries like piping. If you take water somewhere, like water to the sink in your house, and my sink is right there, you have to bring it back. So there's always a system of essentially parallel running pipes a pipe that takes water to the point of exchange and a pipe that brings water back from the point of exchange. Arteries are like the pipes that take water to the point of exchange, like in this case, the pipes that bring water to the sink. And veins are like uh, uh, pipes that take water back and that water, if I used it to wash the dishes, would be dirty and it would have higher concentrations of certain things in it, right? It would be our wastewater. So, Veins drain tissues and they bring blood back to the heart, but remember that veins are incredibly low pressure systems. So veins are bringing blood back to the heart, but veins are such low pressure systems that they're actually periodically uh, regulated by these things called valves, which are really just folds of the endothelial tissue. So you do not find valves in arteries. If you puncture an artery, the way that the blood is going to come out is it's going to squirt. Every time your heart beats, you're going to get a pulse of blood, and it's going to squirt. And it's really interesting to watch somebody do an arterial blood gas for the first time. Veins, on the other hand, the reason that we take vein venous blood samples much more commonly than arterial blood samples, it's not that you don't take arterial blood samples, it's just that blood or when we do serology or blood analytics, we usually get the sample from a vein, are very low pressure systems. So when you puncture a vein, the blood kind of oozes rather than squirts because it's so low pressure and it's not fluctuating with systole and diastole at that point. So low pressure, in fact, that gravity can actually pull against the flow of blood and force it to go in the opposite direction. So we have these valves here in order to prevent that from happening. Because remember, valves promote a unidirectional blood flow or a unidirectional blood system. So if I was to ask you what type of blood vessel or identify the type of blood vessel we're looking at, I'd expect you to be able to label all the major layers, all the sublayers, and then tell me some anatomical features that are unique to veins. 
Most importantly, veins have valves in order to prevent backflow because they're low pressure systems taking blood back to the heart. And they have these really thin, smooth muscle layers in their tunica media because they don't really regulate the distribution of blood in the body. When they're taking blood back to the heart, they have a little bit of vascular tone, but they're not shunting blood to certain areas. They're really kind of taking blood back to the heart. They can also kind of engorge a little bit and function like a blood reservoir. So think about some of those major differences and think about why we pull blood from veins rather than arteries in a typical situation. So as we continue along, we have this idea that I've given you in your follow along of mean arterial pressure, which is essentially just the average blood pressure between systole and diastole that's being exerted on the arteries of your body. So I've given you a problem in which I say Jessica has a blood pressure of 120 over 80. Recall from lab that mean arterial pressure is the average pressure of blood flowing through the cardiovascular system. Some critical values uh, to determine mean arterial pressure are your pulse pressure, which is the systolic pressure, in this case 120 minus the diastolic pressure, which in this case is 80. So your pulse pressure would be 40. And then mean arterial pressure is diastolic plus one third multiplied by systolic minus diastolic, which is your pulse pressure. And are you going to be asked to calculate mean arterial pressure on the exam? You 100% will. So make sure to do that follow along. Now, Let's think about the functional role of arteries. So if you go back to your first page and you list your five major blood vessels, list some characteristics of arteries. Label that artery in that vein because I promise you that will be worth your time to do with respect to the exam. So when you think about the functional role of arteries, arteries take blood away from the heart. When the ventricles go into systole, they force blood up and out the semilunar valves into the system of arteries that we have in our body. During ventricular systole, there's a pulse of blood, a pulsatile flow of blood, and that pulsatile flow, that increased blood pressure, causes the arteries to expand, right? So the arteries expand during ventricular systole, but during ventricular diastole, the arteries undergo recoil. They undergo elastic recoil. This elastic recoil is really, 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 really important in maintaining diastolic pressure. So why when the ventricles are contracting is, the blood, is, is blood pressure roughly around 120, 120 millimeters of mercury? Right? And then when they're relaxing, it's about 80 millimeters of mercury. Why doesn't it drop to zero? Well, it doesn't drop to zero because it's not just the ventricles that are promoting that pressure gradient that are promoting the flow of blood through the body. The elastic recoil of arteries is really important in maintaining diastolic pressure because as the arteries recoil, they physically force blood through the cardiovascular system. They generate a gradient, another pressure gradient that forces blood through the cardiovascular system so our diastolic blood pressure doesn't plummet and we don't get this huge pulse pressure, the difference between our systolic and our diastolic, which would put a huge amount of stress on our arteries. So that's a really important value, pulse pressure. So this is just kind of a schematic. We get contraction of the ventricles. We'll focus on the left ventricle. Contraction of the left ventricle moves blood into the artery. Notice that the artery is expanding then recoiling as blood flows through. And that expansion and recoil can be felt as a pulse. So in an awake conscious adult, you always feel for the radial pulse. In an unconscious adult, you feel for the carotid pulse. In an infant, you feel for the brachial pulse, right? So there are different areas that we feel pulses, but pulses are literally pulsations of arteries. And arteries are capable of doing that because they can expand and recoil because they're perfused with so much elastic tissue. Remember that the anatomy determines the physiology. The structure determines the function. The elastic recoil of arteries is really, really important in maintaining diastolic blood pressure. The elastic recoil of arteries is really, really important in maintaining diastolic blood pressure. 
Otherwise, if there was no elasticity to arteries, diastolic would drop really, really low, and it would, what's called, widen your pulse pressure. So we're going to talk about that for a minute. If we look at this pulse pressure over here, we get our systolic pressure, our diastolic pressure. The difference between systolic and diastolic, in this case 120 and 80, is 40. That's what our pulse pressure is. It's systolic minus diastolic. So we have 120, which is our systolic, 80, which is our diastolic. You subtract one from the other, you have a pulse pressure. A wide pulse pressure is a pulse pressure in which the systolic is much higher than the diastolic. And a narrow pulse pressure is a pulse pressure in which the systolic and the diastolic are very close to one another meaning that the systolic and diastolic don't differ by much. An average pulse pressure is about 40 millimeters of mercury. So we're going to go through this particular abstract that I've given you, and we're going to think about what pulse pressure can tell you about the overall health of a blood vessel. So everybody should be following along we've calculated mean arterial pressure we've labeled our blood vessels we've talked about the five blood vessels we need to know we've talked about what dictates peripheral resistance and the importance of vasoconstriction and vasodilation with respect to calculating blood flow and we've brought up some numerical values with that now we're going to look at what pulse pressures can tell us about a patient's overall metabolic health <clears throat> So the title of the article is <clears throat> Treating Blood Pressure to Prevent Strokes, the Age Factor, the Importance of Systolic Blood Pressure, Diastolic Blood Pressure, and Pulse Pressure on the Incidence of Coronary Heart Disease and Stroke are known. However, the importance of blood pressure age shifts regarding the stroke incident is not clearly known. So now the researchers have identified something that isn't clearly, clear, uh, that isn't clearly uh, described in the literature or within common medical paradigms. The blood pressure changes with the advancement of age from the predominance of a diastolic blood pressure in the young to the predominance of a systolic blood pressure in the old. Why would you get a shift from a relatively high diastolic blood pressure when you're young to a relatively low diastolic blood pressure when you're old with a high systolic blood pressure? Well, what's going to happen to arteries over time? Arteries over time, just like anything else, become old and worn out and they get stiff, right? They actually physically get stiffer. And if an artery gets stiffer, it's not going to be able to expand and recoil quite as effectively. So the heart is going to have to work a little bit harder to maintain that mean arterial pressure so organs are being perfused with blood. So this change is due to the stiffening of the large arteries as a result of the aging process and the replacement of elastic fibers with collagen, which is not quite as flexible. This change results in the loss of compliance and elastic recoil, the ability to expand and recoil of these vessels, leading to increased pulse wave velocity, central systolic blood pressure, and widening of pulse pressure, leading to an increased incident of uh, coronary heart disease and strokes. It has been demonstrated epidemiologically that SBP rises with linearly with age, whereas DP, D B P diastolic blood pressure rises up to the age of 45 to 50 years and then begins to decline after the age of 60 years old, leading to progressive widening of the PP. So when we think about the functional role of arteries, right, they take blood away from the heart, but they also contribute to diastolic blood pressure by being able to expand and then recoil. And as we get older, the ability of blood vessels to recoil decreases because we get stiffening in our arteries, and that's not good to have stiff arteries. As the arteries become stiffer, the ventricles have to contract with more force in order to maintain a mean arterial pressure, right? So the ventricles in the heart start working a lot harder. So the systolic blood pressure in somebody with stiff arteries is going to be very high, whereas the diastolic blood pressure in somebody with stiff arteries is going to be very low. And that wide pulse pressure can tell you about stiffening of the arteries and things like plaque formations in the arteries. A narrow pulse pressure, on the other hand, 
meaning a pulse pressure, let's say we had a pulse pressure of 100 over 80, so a pulse pressure of 20. Narrow pulse pressures can tell us about things like heart failure. If somebody has congestive heart failure, their arteries, right, probably still have quite a bit of elasticity. It's just that their heart isn't contracting with a lot of force. So when their heart contracts and moves blood out of it, the systolic blood pressure isn't very high because the heart physically can't produce that much contractile force, right? So the systolic and the diastolic are very similar to one another in people who have uh, something like congestive heart failure. And recognizing the importance of those values and being able to kind of reason things out with respect to those values is important. Now, I'm not going to make you memorize specific blood pressure numbers, but I will give you a reference range on an exam, and I may ask you questions about it. So hypotension, right, is when we look at this, look at the mean arterial pressure. So we can look at the systolic, the diastolic, and then when it's saying look at mean arterial pressure, we could plug in those numbers to a calculator or, you know, to the, not to a calculator, but to the formula I just gave you. So if you have a, in this case, systolic below 90 or a diastolic below 60, you are hypotensive. The danger of being hypotensive is you're not perfusing organs, notably things like your brain, meaning that organs aren't getting enough blood because there's not enough pressure to push blood through. A healthy blood pressure is between 90 and 119 systolic, 60 to 79 diastolic. They used to say 120 over 80 was an average blood pressure. That's a bit pre-hypertensive. Acceptable, 120 to 139, 80 to 89 with respect to systolic and diastolic pressures. If you have a systolic pressure over 140 or a diastolic pressure over 90, and they're usually correlated with one another, you are hypertensive. If you have a systolic above 180 and a diastolic above 110, you are critically hypertensive or you're in what's called hypertensive crisis. And that's really important for a lot of medical professionals to realize. Hypertension essentially tears your blood vessels apart. It causes collagen fibers to peek their ugly heads in, and we've talked about clotting cascades. It puts you at increased risk for things like stroke, or it puts you at increased risk for vessels just losing their integrity and physically bursting, so things like aneurysms, which is where blood vessels burst. So hypertension shouldn't be taken lightly because what you're doing is you're ripping up blood vessels internally and you're putting yourself at a profoundly increased risk for stroke or aneurysm. It's also putting you at increased risk for things like uh, arteriosclerotic plaque disease or the stiffening of arteries because if you're ripping up those blood vessels too much, those elastic fibers are going to start to tear and the tissue is going to remodel and it's going to start to replace those elastic fibers with collagen fibers and that's not a good thing. Hypertension should be taken seriously. And it is. In fact, you can't, if you're a dental hygienist, if somebody's in hypertensive crisis, you can't perform, uh, you can't do clean their teeth because if you're flossing their teeth, they're going to be bleeding all over the place. So when we take a blood pressure, we took a blood pressure the other day. And what we did is we took this thing called the Spigo manometer. And essentially what we have is a blood pressure cuff. We put the blood pressure cuff over the brachial artery, so over our arms. We uh, pumped up the bulb and increased the pressure of air in the blood pressure cuff to well past 120 millimeters of mercury. Some people were pumping it up to like 210, especially when they were working with my arm and, and they weren't releasing the air valve on the bulb very quickly. So that was problematic because my forearm wasn't getting blood. But that's cool, guys. I'm just, uh, I'm just a teacher, man. My arms don't need blood. So you clamp off blood. And then you slowly let air out of the blood pressure cuff. The moment that the pressure in the brachial artery exceeds the pressure in the blood pressure cuff, blood will start to break through and you'll get turbulent blood flow. That turbulent blood flow is associated with the sounds of quart cough. Your first sound of quart cough is technically your systolic blood pressure. And you'll notice that the needle starts to jump at that point, if you remember. You then continue to release air. Once blood can make its way through the brachial artery, either during ventricular systole or diastole, the moment that that happens, you get laminar blood flow. 
meaning you're not going to hear those sounds of cork cough. The last sound of cork cough when the needle starts to move smoothly is known as your diastolic blood pressure. And that's what a blood pressure actually is, and that's why we use the stethoscope to listen, because we're listening, to, listening for turbulent and laminar blood flow. Now, when we think about the distribution of blood in the body, Arteries are really important in massive controls of distribution of blood in the body, but at the tissue level, the most important vessel controlling where blood is going to go in the body is the arterial. And remember, arterials are considered part of what's called our microcirculation. Now, there are two mechanisms of action that can regulate the activity of arterials. There's autoregulation. So we have paracrine regulation, which is where chemical factors can change the uh, contraction status of the smooth muscle lining arterioles and precapillary sphincters, and the myogenic response, which is actually mediated by blood flow changes and stretch on the blood vessel, which can also change the way that blood vessels react. So that's auto-regulation. Our extrinsic control mechanisms are sympathetic. And remember the type of receptor, I'm not going to make you remember alpha 1, 2, or 3, whether which one are in blood vessels, but the type of receptor you find embedded within the smooth muscle of blood vessels is called an alpha adrenergic receptor. An adrenergic receptor, because adrenergic receptors bind to norepinephrine and epinephrine, and the only division of the nervous system that controls blood vessels with the exception of just a few blood vessel networks that we'll talk about is the sympathetic nervous system. There's one exception with the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system can um, regulate blood vessels associated with the penis and the clitoris. And that can be important, uh, especially if you've suffered uh, from a spinal cord injury. Those reflex arcs are uh, something that people often ask about afterward for reasons that you can probably intuit or guess. So now we're looking, we've gone over page one. And page one was really looking at peripheral resistance and what can increase resistance and therefore increase blood pressure, all the factors that increase blood pressure. The most important of them is the radius of a blood vessel, our cardiac output, and our blood volume. Remember, blood volume and blood pressure have uh, a, a linear relationship with one another. Whatever happens to one happens to the other, essentially. And we had some questions about that. We then listed out our different types of blood vessels. We then did our follow along where we labeled an artery and a vein and talked about the functional roles of arteries and veins. We then went into a tremendous amount of detail talking about arteries. What we are now going to talk about is we are going to talk about arterioles and we are going to talk about venules and we are going to talk about capillaries and precapillary sphincters. So if you look at this, right, this is where we're at in our handout. I think it's uh, just follow along and I'm asking you to label all the things that we're about to go over. So arteries eventually branch and they feed into what are called arterioles. Arterioles, unlike arteries, have an endothelium and then they have a layer of smooth muscle. They are essentially just surrounded entirely by smooth muscle. And because they are surrounded entirely by smooth muscle, they can vasoconstrict and decrease radius or vasodilate and increase radius to a much larger degree than any other blood vessel. And as a consequence of that, arterioles play a hugely important role in regulating the distribution of blood in your body because some tissues need blood at certain times, other tissues don't. So here's your arterial. Now, all of these blood vessels you see going from being red to being blue here, right, in the middle here, these are capillaries. How do you know they're capillaries? Well, any blood vessel that goes from being red to being blue, remember red means oxygenated or oxygen-rich blood, and blue means oxygen-poor blood. So what had to have happened here is there had to have been an exchange between the blood vessel and the tissue, and the only vessel capable of exchange between the blood between the cardiovascular system and the tissues of your body are the capillaries. So we have our capillaries, right? We know that because they go from being red to blue. 
Running through the middle here, we have what's called a meta arterial. And then over here, with essentially or virtually no smooth muscle surrounding it, we have our venule, which ultimately fuses and feeds into this vein, which is going to bring blood back to the heart. So that's what we're looking at here. That's just to kind of orient ourselves. So I've asked you to label all of those things on the image I've given you and know that this is a very, very small chunk we're looking at. Right? We're looking at the microscopic anatomy right now. We're looking at a very small part of a very small, a very small part of a tissue. Right? We're not looking at something you can see with the unaided eye. We are zoomed in. So what types of receptors are located in the walls of arterioles? Well, the types of receptors that the sympathetic nervous system utilizes are alpha adrenergic receptors in blood vessels. Now, what we are going to talk about for just a moment is we are going to talk about our autoregulatory responses, and then we are going to talk about our extrinsic or our sympathetically mediated responses and how blood flow is controlled. So remember that blood flow doesn't go to the same place at the same rate all the time. Blood flow is controlled or distributed to tissues that need blood, and it's shunted away from tissues that don't really need that much blood in order to maximize the efficiency of the system. That's what they're doing. So before we move on, I just want to quickly talk about a meta-arterial. Meta-arterials act as bypass channels. They're particularly important for the circulation of white blood cells. If you remember, capillaries are so small that red blood cells fit through one at a time. So unless there's some kind of inflammatory response, white blood cells, because they don't contribute to exchange, unless there's some sort of inflammation going on, don't typically enter into the capillary networks, but they still need to circulate around the cardiovascular system. And one of the ways in which they do that is they go through the meta-arterials, which essentially shunt them directly from the arterial network to the venous network. And that's what they are. They're little bypass routes for things like white blood cells. Just want to point that out before we start moving on. Autoregulation. Autoregulation. If precapillary sphincters constrict, blood flow to those particular capillary networks will decrease, right? Because when you decrease the radius of a blood vessel resistance increases and flow decreases. In other words, you constrict a blood vessel and you're not going to, or you constrict a precapillary sphincter and blood flow to a particular capillary network is going to decrease. So let's talk about the myogenic response really quickly. And let's talk about what the myogenic response is. And let's see if we can figure this thing out. Let's say that this particular blood vessel network right here that the mean arterial pressure or the amount of blood flowing through these particular blood vessels increased dramatically. If the amount of blood flowing through these particular blood vessels increased dramatically, the amount of blood entering into these capillaries would increase dramatically. So let's say we have blood flow and it just starts flowing into these capillaries and we get a huge amount of blood flow into those capillaries. Well, what happens with the myogenic response? Myo means muscle, or well, my means muscle, and then that's the combining form, and genic means produced by, or the product of. So the myogenic response is actually mediated. It's an autoregulatory mechanism mediated by the tissue itself. And essentially what happens is when precapillary sphincters stretch, it means there's too much blood going to a particular area. So the precapillary sphincter stretch, indicating too much blood is going to a particular capillary bed. And what the precapillary sphincters will do in response is they will constrict in order to reduce the amount of blood flow to those particular capillary networks. That's the myogenic response. It's based on blood flow. And the stretch of the precapillary sphincter can actually trigger a localized, I won't say reflex, but... Uh, a localized response in which the precapillary sphincters constrict, reducing the amount of blood flow to that particular area because it's getting too much blood. And we want to idealize or optimize where we're delivering blood in the body, right? So that's one mechanism. That's one mechanism that can happen.
Now, another mechanism that can happen is we have paracrine factors. And remember, paracrine factors are chemical factors released by cells locally that act on other cells locally. So paracrine factors are factors that are released by cells locally that act on other cells locally. So let's say that in this particular area, let's say in this particular area, and I really want you to think about it because I don't have like a dynamic image to show this to you. We get a decrease in oxygen, an increase in carbon dioxide. So if oxygen levels decrease, it's almost inevitable that carbon dioxide levels are going to increase because cells are still going to be carrying out cellular respiration because they need things like ATP energy, those silly little guys. You're going to get an increase in metabolic byproducts like lactic and carbonic acid, right? And we'll talk about histamine at the end. If you had low O2 and high CO2, what would you want to do to the capillaries that were feeding the tissues that were oxygen deprived and that were building up wastes? You would want to dilate those precapillary sphincters and you'd physically want to bring blood to those areas in order to deliver oxygen to those tissues and rinse carbon dioxide away from those tissues. So oftentimes the myogenic response has a bit of an opposite effect of the paracrine response and I want you to really just intuit that out. If blood flow increases, we want to decrease blood flow because we're probably getting too much blood to a particular capillary network. If oxygen levels decrease and carbon dioxide levels increase and metabolic wastes build up, we want to get blood to that area, right, in order to deliver oxygen and get rid of all those metabolic wastes where they can enter into our circulation and be handled by the respective systems that handle them. So think about C and D on your particular example and think about the constriction dilation status of those precapillary sphincters and which capillaries are going to be getting uh, blood and which capillaries aren't going to be getting blood or how the body is going to respond to this. So extrinsic control is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. It just means control externally, essentially, and that's why the nervous system and the endocrine system are two systems of homeostasis. They can detect uh, sense and respond to changes within the internal environment and affect other organs and organ systems. So if this is a postganglionic sympathetic motor neuron releasing norepinephrine binding to an alpha adrenergic receptor, there's a certain number of action potentials per unit time because we always have just a little bit of vascular tone, meaning that our blood vessels have a little bit of contractile status to that smooth muscle. If we want to vasoconstrict a blood vessel, decreasing blood flow, so if we vasoconstrict a blood vessel, we'll decrease blood flow, but we will increase the pressure of the blood flowing through that particular vessel. What we're going to do is we're going to increase the amount of norepinephrine that we're releasing and allowing to bind to those alpha adrenergic receptors. And look at the frequency of action potential taking place here. Action potential arrives at synaptic end bulb, activates voltage-gated calcium channels, which trigger the exocytosis of a neurotransmitter, and in this case, norepinephrine, and we get vasoconstriction. Remember that small changes in the radius of a blood vessel produce gigantic changes with respect to blood flow. On the flip token, if we want to dilate a blood vessel and increase blood flow while simultaneously decreasing blood pressure, we just inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. It fires action potentials less frequently, less norepinephrine is released, that smooth muscle relaxes, and there we go. Now, what we're going to talk about is we are about to talk about capillaries. So we've talked about arteries, we've talked about uh, vein, we've talked about arteries, we've talked about arterioles, we've talked about how arterioles feed into capillary networks, we've talked about precapillary sphincters and meta arterioles, we've briefly talked about venules, but our focal point now is going to be on the capillary itself because capillaries are the most abundant and most important of the blood vessels in your body. So capillaries are by far the most abundant and most important of the blood vessels in your body.
And we're on, when you think about the page that you're going through, through the lecture handouts you get in each class, we're on follow along capillaries. So let's put this into the broader context. Blood returns from the systemic circulation via the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus into the right atrium. It passively starts filling the right ventricle. The right atrium goes into systole. It contracts from base to apex, moving blood down into the ventricle, topping the ventricle off, not filling it up. Ventricle contracts from or goes into systole from apex to base. Blood moves through the pulmonary, pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries. Many people are going to call those arteries veins on the exam because they're blue, but that's not actually what dictates an artery or vein. It's its structure and direction of blood flow. Now, the pulmonary arteries are going to branch to form pulmonary arterioles and eventually feed into capillaries. Whenever you see blood vessels going from being blue to being red, you are talking about capillaries. Why in this case are they going from being blue to being red? Well, if you look at the capillaries, the capillaries are actually exchanging with the sacs of the lungs. And if you look at this little gif here, carbon dioxide is moving along its pressure gradient and it's diffusing from the blood vessel into the alveoli of the lungs where it can be exhaled, right? So that's where all that carbon dioxide from cellular respiration goes. And then oxygen that we inhale is physically diffusing across the alveoli or the alveolus wall, across the capillary wall, binding to the hemoglobin in our red blood cells. And notice how the blood cells go from being kind of a, a darker red to a lighter red. That's just indicating oxygenation status of the hemoglobin. So we get rid of carbon dioxide at the level of pulmonary capillaries and we pick up oxygen. That oxygen-rich blood is then returned to the left side of the heart, to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Why are those veins red? Be careful of that on an exam. Pulmonary veins through the bicuspid, a.k.a. left atrioventricular, a.k.a. mitral valve, to the left ventricle, left ventricle up and out the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta, which is going to branch to form all the arteries and arterioles that ultimately feed to systemic capillaries. At systemic capillaries, notice what's happening to those blood cells as they move through. We are delivering, so the extracellular fluid of blood, by the way, is blood plasma. And at the capillary, excess hydrostatic pressure forces plasma across the capillary wall. We also get the diffusion of oxygen across the capillary wall. The movement of substances across the capillary wall, usually small water-soluble substances and things like gases, is called filtration. It then moves into this space called the interstitial space. The moment that fluid is no longer in the cardiovascular system and it's in the cells surrounding your tissues, so that fluid has moved from the cardiovascular system to the cells surrounding your tissues, it's no longer called blood plasma. It's called interstitial fluid. So we're delivering good stuff to cells like oxygen and nutrients and sometimes chemical signaling molecules and the cells are actually getting rid of bad stuff. Now that bad stuff is going to diffuse along its concentration gradient things like carbon dioxide and metabolic waste and they're going to move from the interstitial fluid back into the capillary. The movement of interstitial fluid back into the capillary where it becomes blood plasma again is called reabsorption. And the reabsorption that takes place in capillaries, particularly systemic capillaries, tends to be metabolic waste carbon dioxide rich fluid that's getting reabsorbed so it can be handled by other systems of our body. Any of that fluid that's left over, we don't want excess interstitial fluid or it'll produce edema, gets drained into lymphatic capillaries and those lymphatic capillaries will take that lymph in the same direction as venous return of blood to the heart. And those are your extracellular fluids. That's just kind of a dynamic uh, GIF showing you those. So when we think about the types of capillaries we have, right? So we have different types of capillaries in our body. I've given you a follow along to do with the capillaries here, and then we're going to talk about what constitutes or what dictates exchange. There are three types of capillaries. 
you're going to have to be able to recognize them. You're going to have to be able to draw pictures of them. You're going to have to be able to answer critical thinking questions about them. Capillary number one is called a continuous capillary. Continuous capillaries, the simple squamous epithelial cells that make up the endothelium, which is all capillaries are, their endothelium and basement membrane, are connected via tight junctions. And as blood flows through, these tight junctions prevent material from freely moving across the capillary wall. We have continuous capillaries these capillaries connected by these very tight junctions where we don't want free exchange between the blood and the tissue surrounding it. So we have continuous capillaries in the skin in order to avoid things like water loss and the buildup of fluid. We have continuous capillaries in nervous and connective tissue. In nervous tissue, these continuous capillaries, these tight junctions form barriers. And they form barriers all over the place. But when you hear the blood-brain barrier, you're not talking about one, you're not talking about like a layer of fat that forms a wall between the rest of your body and your brain. You're talking about all of the capillaries in the brain and all of the simple squamous epithelial cells that are attached by tight junctions. And what continuous capillaries do, particularly in places like the blood-brain barrier, is they prevent the free movement of solutes from the capillary into the surrounding tissues. So that's just something, it's not that solutes and, and substances don't move, but it's just much more tightly regulated in those areas. So they're the least leaky of them all. Fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrations are little holes. I often make you draw, as a short answer question, I often make you draw the different types of capillaries for me. Fenestrated capillaries are just capillaries in which the cells themselves have little fenestrations or holes. Now, you find fenestrated capillaries anywhere where you're going to get a lot of exchange. So remember that the movement of plasma across the capillary wall into the surrounding space where it becomes interstitial fluid or whatever type of special fluid it is, maybe filtrate, that process is called filtration. And when you think about what the kidneys do, the kidneys filter blood plasma. That's what they do. That's one of their primary functional roles. So it makes sense that you'd find an abundance of fenestrated capillaries in the kidneys. Endocrine glands have fenestrated capillaries because when they produce a hormone, they need to be able to physically get it into the bloodstream so it can be swept along and move along. The small intestines have fenestrated capillaries for the same reasons. So the lumen of your GI tract is lined by these fenestrated capillaries. When you eat uh, something and you break it down to its constituent particles, things like amino acids and glucose and all the electrolytes and things like water, they're absorbed along the lining of your GI tract, that simple columnar epithelial tissue in the small intestines. And then they interact with these fenestrated capillaries and those molecules physically move or are reabsorbed across those fenestrations where those nutrients are absorbed into the blood plasma and then ultimately taken to the liver. And we'll talk about that at another point in time. So it makes sense why these would be a little bit more leaky. Sinusoidal capillaries have gigantic holes or sinuses in them, super large pores, big spaces between the endothelial cells. And you find these wherever you need to allow cells to cross the capillary membrane. These capillary cells are too big. Sinusoidal capillaries, cells can cross. So bone marrow. Bone marrow makes red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. If you're making red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, you need a mechanism to physically get them into the cardiovascular system. You squeeze them through these sinuses and these sinusoidal capillaries that feed into those tissues. The spleen filters out and functions as a reservoir for red blood cells. In order to filter red blood cells out of the system, you need to be able to physically get those red blood cells from the cardiovascular system to the parenchymal cells or to the functional tissue of the spleen. The liver also filters out things like old, worn out red blood cells. And those blood cells just kind of percolate through. So wherever you need to, an exchange at the level of having to physically move cells back and forth, sinusoidal capillaries are very effective at that. They're very, very what's called leaky. They're the leakiest. They're like a, they're like a, they're like a bad white house.
They're just leaking, leaking information all over the place. So when we think about this capillary, this would be a little fenestrated capillary. Here are red blood cells squeezing through one at a time. We know arteries feed into arterioles, arterioles feed into capillaries. Capillaries are like U-turns in the cardiovascular system. Here are some blood proteins. We'll consider that one to be a globulin, this albumin, maintaining blood colloid osmotic pressure. I've thrown in an immunoglobulin there, an antibody, just going around going, oh, I want an antigen, I'm going to attack something. So that excess hydrostatic pressure produced by the beating of the heart but dissipates within the capillaries that are still intermediate pressure systems, forces a little bit of blood plasma across the capillary wall into the space surrounding cells. That space surrounding cells is called the interstitial space. The moment that blood plasma moves across the capillary wall into that space, it's no longer called blood plasma, it's called interstitial fluid. And it's interstitial fluid that exchanges with the tissue of the cells. So oxygen, nutrients, chemical signaling molecules broop, are going to the tissue cells. Things like metabolic waste, carbon dioxide are moving in the opposite direction from the interstitial fluid, and some of that interstitial fluid will be reabsorbed. The movement of interstitial fluid back into the blood vessel where it becomes part of the blood plasma, again, is called reabsorption. Any of that fluid that's left over gets drained by the lymphatic system where it forms a third type of extracellular fluid that we call lymph. So when you look at a capillary under a microscope, it's just endothelial tissue, right, with a basement membrane. And red blood cells are just kind of squeezing through like a conga line. They can even fold in half, kind of like little tortillas, right? And they're just carrying out gas exchange, and then you get that plasma and that exchange, and all this space around here is your interstitial space. The fluid you find out here is interstitial fluid. The fluid you find out in here is blood plasma. So when we talk about extracellular fluid in general, we're talking about plasma, interstitial fluid, and... Lymph as well, although lymph is not as heavily highlighted in many of your like fluid and electrolyte balance sections in your nursing programs. So when you think about continuous capillaries, continuous capillaries can utilize different mechanisms, more regulated mechanisms to move substances. Transcytosis is when essentially through the process of endocytosis, we bring bulk material into the cell. We move it across the cell along a vesicle. It's not really just floating. There's probably some motor protein carrying it along some cytoskeletal choo-choo tracks in there. And it fuses on the other end where we get exocytosis. And so there are different mechanisms that we can use to get stuff across. Not a major focal point for the exam, but it is an important process, and it is one that I want to highlight. So this is just another schematic showing you kind of what happens. One of the things I'm going to point out here is when I talk about capillaries from now on, I'm going to talk about the arterial end of the capillary, meaning the part of the capillary that's closer to the arterial, and the venous end of the capillary, which is the part of the capillary that's closer to the venule, because that becomes important with respect to some of the mathematics of predicting filtration versus reabsorption. So... When we're looking at this particular image right here, so we're looking at this image, we're looking at an image, we see these three little kids with these distended bellies, and we're going to talk about how things like starvation can potentially produce edema or belly edema. So when you want to predict, you see this 7,200 liters a day flowing through your capillary networks? That is a staggering amount of fluid movement. 7,200 liters is a, just a huge amount of fluid to move. I'm, I'm sorry, the heart and is a workhorse. The cardiovascular system is a workhorse. But now we're at the level of the capillaries, and we're trying to predict whether we are going to get net filtration or net reabsorption. So... This should be called net filtration pressure. It's called net pressure here. I'm going to call it NFP, or I'm going to call it net filtration pressure on an exam. And essentially, you take the force that favors filtration, which in this case is hydrostatic pressure from the heart. So 
The beating heart produces our blood pressure. We have a little bit of excess hydrostatic pressure that promotes the movement of substances across the capillary wall. When substances move across the capillary wall, that's called filtration. So are we going to get net movement of fluid into the interstitial fluid? The force that favors reabsorption is called blood colloid osmotic pressure or BCOP. It's just calling it colloid osmotic pressure, but it's actually blood colloid osmotic pressure or BCOP. And remember what protein determined BCOP? Albumins. There are other proteins in there, but albumins remain in the blood. So the blood actually has a higher osmotic pressure than the interstitial fluid, meaning that if there were no hydrostatic pressure here and it was just osmotic pressure, these blood vessels would start to have net reabsorption taking place, right? Because they have a higher osmotic pressure. Remember when we were going over osmosis, water follows non-penetrant solute. And albumin proteins are non-penetrant solutes that produce what's called an osmotic pressure. They produce a situation in which water wants to move, that water doesn't really want to move, in which the physical forces that govern the movement of water will promote its movement in one direction. Water, to my understanding, doesn't have sentient consciousness and it can't make a clear and coherent decision about whether it wants to do anything. So, you have hydrostatic pressure. In this case, 32 millimeters of mercury. What's indicated by pi is BCOP, or blood colloid osmotic pressure. 32 minus 25 gives us a net filtration pressure of 7. A positive net filtration pressure means that there is going to be the flow of blood plasma into the interstitial space. Plasma to the interstitial space is called filtration, and you're going to get net filtration. But even though 7,200 liters of fluid are moving through here a day, you only get a net flow out of about 3 liters. So there has to be a little bit of reabsorption. And if you notice, blood colloid osmotic pressure, which is determined by those albumins, right? So remember, there's non-penetrant solute in here a higher concentration of non-penetrant solute in the plasma than there is in the interstitial fluid, notice that this doesn't change. But the hydrostatic pressure does because blood needs to flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So on the arterial end of a capillary, you tend to get net filtration, but on the venous end of the capillary, because hydrostatic pressure drops, you get tend to get net reabsorption. So with your NFP or your net filtration pressure, if you ever take hydrostatic pressure and subtract blood colloid osmotic pressure, which in this case will give us negative 10 millimeters of mercury, a negative net filtration pressure will always produce net reabsorption, meaning that the forces that dictate the movement of water, now the osmotic uh, gradient or the osmotic pressure promoting the movement of water back into the blood plasma is greater. Now, where does this net flow of three liters a day go? If we were producing three liters a day every day and there was no mechanism to get rid of it, that would be massively problematic because we, our bodies would edema and we'd essentially have elephantiasis or lymphatic filariasis. Not elephantitis, that's inflammation of an elephant. And elephants do have inflammation, but it is tiasis, just to, on, a, on a note, that's in a condition of edema that stems from the lymphatic system. So, and a little parasite, a little worm. But, um, okay. So, suppose, think about this figure question, but we're going to think about our question that I've given you here. So, we have these children with edema bellies, and there are different types of starvation. There's Quashicor, which is essentially protein starvation, and there's marsmus, which is uh, just general malnutrition starvation in general, right? It, it, meaning that it's not a specific macromolecule that's lacking, it's usually a combination. Quashicor is the most common type of starvation globally. So when we think about how Quashicor can produce an edema belly, what do you notice? What do you notice? about the blood colloid osmotic pressure in the examples I've given you. So the blood colloid osmotic pressure on this particular example in a healthy system is about 25 mmHg. 
In the system I've given you with these children that have the edema bellies, it's about 10 mmHg. Why would blood colloid osmotic pressure drop in a group of individuals who didn't get enough protein in their diet, who were suffering from protein starvation? Well, albumins are proteins made in the liver. If you're not getting enough protein in your diet, you're not getting enough amino acids, the raw materials to physically build those albumins. As a consequence of that, the body is not going to synthesize as many albumin proteins because it's trying to allocate its protein resources to the most critical needs. If the concentration of albumins in the system drops, blood colloid osmotic pressure is going to drop. And what you notice is that hydrostatic pressure essentially remains higher than blood colloid osmotic pressure in those networks at both the arterial and the venous end, meaning you get net filtration at two points. If you're getting net filtration at two points, you're going to start to overflow those systems of drainage, and that's what produces belly edema, right? So really think about that question. The final thing we're going to talk about are veins. You know these are veins because they have valves. So capillaries drain into venules. Venules fuse to form larger vessels called veins. Veins are very low pressure systems. Veins are incredibly low pressure systems comparative to arteries. When you pull blood from a vein, blood oozes, right? So when you pull blood from a vein, blood oozes. It doesn't squirt. And when you look at these veins, Notice that these veins, one, we know they're veins because they have valves, but they're being right routed through skeletal muscles. And because veins are such low pressure systems, the reason that many of them are routed through skeletal muscles is because when we contract our skeletal muscles, they actually compress the vein, helping to facilitate venous return of blood to the heart. In other words, movement is medicine. If you leave somebody sitting, for example, in a bed for too long in an intensive care situation and they're not up and moving, you can actually start to get edema and, and the formation of, uh, of bed sores and things like that because you aren't circulating the fluids. I used to work with kids who had had spinal cord injuries. And one of the things we would do is we would move their body around. We'd pull them out of bed. It's called continuous passive motion. We'd physically move their body around to circulate fluids like synovial fluid, facilitate lymphatic drainage, and to help facilitate venous return of blood to the heart. So movement is medicine, and when you move around, you're actually activating those skeletal muscle pumps, and you're getting a more efficient cardiovascular system because blood isn't pooling in your veins. It reduces the risk for all sorts of things. So when you look at this here, bleep, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't make that sound. That's just what I imagine when I when I hear it. So when you look at this histological image I've given you, how do you know that's a vein? Well, you know it's a vein. It has a valve in it, right? It's a very clear valve, but now we're just looking at it histologically. One of the problems with veins is that if you don't move around, right, or you have poor circulation and venous blood flow is particularly low pressure in your venous systems, that blood can start to pool as a consequence of the forces of gravity. And sometimes that pooling or that backflow of blood can cause valves to fail. And when a valve fails in a vein, you're going to get pooling of blood in that vein, and that vein is going to bulge out, and you're going to be able oftentimes to see it externally. And that's really what a varicose vein is. A varicose vein is a consequence of a valve that is kind of, its structural integrity has been lost. And they run the range from the little spider veins to big varicose veins to really dangerous medical situations that can put you at increase that are painful and inflamed and can put you at increased risk for developing deep vein thrombosis or blood clots. So uh, it's a good idea to take those out. And it's not purely just aesthetic that we're talking about. It's not, it's not just a vanity thing we're talking about. So that's presentation number one, off the fly, off the cuff. No editing. What's up, dog? What's up?